William, what are you doing? Why, Judy, there is nothing like the fresh scent of eau du lilac. <laughs> and speaking of fresh, stay tuned for a fresh episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. We're at the Hulda Klager Lilac Gardens in Woodland, Washington and helping kick off Lilac Days, which is starting today. Later in the show, I'll be talking with Ruth about all the beautiful flowers that you could find here. And speaking of beautiful flowers, we're also going to be giving you some tips on how to grow orchids. We'll also be talking about snakes in the garden. On a plane? No, they're pretty fancy. <laughs> but coming up first, the prickly story of agaves. Well, I am back with Ron at Blooming Junction, and today we're going to be talking about agaves. And Ron, you have a great selection of, of ones that you pulled here. To the, so let's just jump right in and talk about every one of them. Okay. Well, um, the first and probably one of my favorite, probably because it's so easy to handle, I call this my friendly one. This is, <laughs> this is the calamar um, because it gives the appearance of an octopus. Um, this is a great one. Obviously, it sends up little pups here and there, and um, you know you could actually divide the plant if you want, sure, or just sure. let it grow into a nice big mound. But this is a great plant here. Um, gets about uh, two feet tall by two feet wide, and a lot of these actually have some some good size to them, don't they? That's right. Um, and this one here, the frosty blue. Um, is on the other end of the spectrum. It gets six to eight feet tall. Oh, come on. That, that's massive. It is massive. That little guy will, and, and they grow very quickly, very quickly. Even in our area here, they'll grow quickly. Yep. These are all zone seven, zone eight. Wow. This one looks much more gentle than it actually is because it hurts a lot. <laughs> it is. This is a striata, and this one that will get you every time. All my customers insist on touching it, even though I warn well, them. Well, it's and... deceptive. It looks like it would feel really gentle and soft, right. and it's not at all. Right. And this is a um, this is a great one too. It stays low, 18 inches, but it gets nice and and fat, about 36 inches. Wow. Wow. And this is I love the shape of this. That's the uh, Okahui. So that that doesn't sound like Latin. That sounds more like Hawaii, it does. doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Um, and that's a that's a nice one too. That one gets about two to three feet tall and it's wide. And it looks like to me it would be kind of a spreader. Yeah, it gets a nice a nice uniform mound on it though. Nice. And what's right in front of it? I love that like almost fringy sides to it. And that one's a black widow, and that one is um, another one that's on the shorter side. It gets about a foot tall, about eighteen inches wide. And I love that, I don't know if Jeff can see this when I tip it over, but I love that on the underside of the leaves there's that pattern from the from the growth that happens. It's it looks kind of black widowy yeah, to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great one. And this is I love the color of this. Yeah, that one there is the uh, the silver agave. And that one's gonna be another one that stays about 18 inches tall. And it'll then, get nice and wide. And this one here, this is my absolute favorite. This one here is um, this particular one is shark skin. Ah, uh, yes. And it's just got just beautiful color to it. Um, in the evening, it takes on a nice glow um, around the edges. It's, it grows about three feet tall by about three feet wide. And again, it's got some pups here too. Now, speaking of that, I heard you mention that earlier. So I'll show the camera here on this one too. What, what should you do? If anything, if this starts happening with agave, you know, I wouldn't do anything to it. I would just let it grow naturally, like it would, you know. Yeah, in nature. In nature, right? And then that begs the question: What do we need to do to really, you know, give the best opportunity for these to thrive in the Northwest? Well, absolutely, um, drainage is probably the most important thing. Um, the cold, um, they'll accept the cold. What they won't accept is a lot of wet. Okay. Um, so you want to make sure that you plant them a little bit higher than you would a normal plant. You don't want to plant them in any kind of a valley. Oh, you don't want drainage into the, the root ball there. Okay. Correct. Because if water collects around it, then they'll rot out. Um, I always recommend that you plant it kind of on the top of a mound sure. or the side of the mound where the water will drain off. Now, you know, our producer of the show, they actually have a couple that aren't 
really all that hardy, but they keep them in the pots every couple of years. They'll bit it, bit, and they just drop that in the ground. Is yeah. that something to do too with these even? You can, yeah. So how, how does one get weeds out of these plants without you know ending up a bloody mess? <laughs> well, some of them are easier than others, like the calamar, the, sure. my friendly one here. You can just pull the weeds around it. Something like the striata, I would probably use some kind of long tweezers, but if you're gonna have them in the garden, I would suggest planting them and then applying a pre-emergent around them so you don't have to get your fingers in there. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. And then one, it also begs the question of maintenance because in nature, they might actually do this as they get older and the leaves fade out, but in our gardens, we don't really want that. Yeah, I mean, um, something like this here, it's an old leaf, it's, a, it's eventually gonna shrivel up and just go away. Uh -huh. But, you know, if you have uh, a little bit of dye back from the tip, you could just take your printers and cut it right off. Oh, wow, okay. I would probably cut it a little further bit. down. Yeah, yeah. But, and you're, oh, so basically just do some careful cleaning up as right. they go and they'll right. be fine. Now, you know, one of the things I loved out here, Ron, is you have a wonderful dry garden that you That's planted. Right. In fact, we were here before and, and filmed with you on that. And you have a lot of these in that space, don't you? We do, we do. Um, I believe we have all of these out there. Nice. Yeah. So you can really, if, you, if you've never been out to Blooming Junction, it's a, it's a really cool new nursery for us. And you can come out and stroll through this garden. It's a big dry garden and see all kinds of plants besides the agave that work. And really without water in the summer. That's right. So, and that's, that's right. something that these would love, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> so for more information, we invite you to go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over to the Blooming Junction website. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. A fun time, Ron. Success in the garden starts with the right plant in the right place. Farmington Gardens can help you succeed in planting and selecting for any corner of your garden. Spring is a fantastic time of year. Colorful, fresh, fragrant. And Farmington Gardens will help you revitalize your garden. So let's get started. We're here to help. Open every day and just a short drive out Farmington Road. Farmington Gardens, we're growing for you. Millions of tulip bulbs transform this farm into one of Oregon's most beautiful events. The Iversons invite you to the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival presented by Silverton Health. Enjoy a tulip market, food and wine, and fun for the kids. The Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival open daily 9 to 6, now through May 1st. Cultivate your desire to learn. Give your learning deeper roots with Garden University at the Oregon Garden. Join us for a variety of lectures, demonstrations, and workshops hosted by experts in the field. Learn about the life cycle and preservation of monarch butterflies and the milkweed they depend on. You'll also get tips on building a monarch-friendly garden in your yard. Help your garden and your mind grow through Garden University at the Oregon Garden. Contact the Oregon Garden for more information or visit OregonGarden.org. For over 100 years, Collier Arborcare and Bartlett Tree Experts have provided tree and shrub care services to the Portland metropolitan area. From large tree and small shrub pruning, tree removal and stump grinding, we can handle all your tree care needs. Our arborists diagnose and treat your toughest insect and disease problems. We also have organic solutions for growing and maintaining healthy gardens, as well as organic nutrition for your trees and shrubs. Collier and Bartlett, environmentally friendly since 1907. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Create a beautiful living space both inside and out with the help of Terra Casa. Outside, you'll find pottery, fountains, and decor to make your garden unforgettable. And inside, there are home furnishings and just the right accents to make your home warm, inviting, and most importantly, comfortable. Terracasa has a huge selection of merchandise to fit any home or budget. Plus, we still have all the unique and distinctive gifts that you have come to expect from Terracasa. Terracasa in downtown Damascus. Garden time just loves coming up to Hulda Klager Lilac Gardens and it's Lilac Days and I'm with Ruth and Ruth, you are past president of the organization here and what is that? 
the Holda Klager Lilac Society. Yes, and they are a great volunteer group that helped to take care of this wonderful place. Yeah, they actually, they helped to save it to start with. Oh, so. that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it was in danger. Mm -hmm. It was going to be plowed under, so they uh, were organized to save it. <laughs> uh, so it is a wonderful place to come and support because it is so wonderful this time of year, especially because it's lilac bloom time. Mm -hmm. This is such a beautiful variety. Which one is this? This is Lilac Sunday. Very and, it, and it was developed back in Boston for, I, they actually have a lilac Sunday back there that they celebrate and that's what this is named for. Ah, just one day when you have this festival that goes all the way to Mother's yes, Day, right. which is so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. But actually today is the kickoff. Mm -hmm. So what happens on the weekends up here at the gardens? Well, we have uh, usually have uh, music in the house and music out in the gardens. Uh, various groups come and, and actually they ask to come and play oh, and wow. they do a great job and uh, uh, we have plants for sale we have the gift shop open we have tours in the house nice and it is Hulda Klager's house yes it is uh -huh. and it's it's uh, restored to look uh, we hope well, she lived there for a lot of years, but it's restored to look mostly how he, she had it. Yeah, so. but there's family photos and really all of the knickknacks and things that she lived with, which is really special. Mm -hmm. And you kind of touched on that there's a plant sale. And you know, this is one of the plants. This is a new variety. And which one is this? This is uh, Colby's Wishing Star. And it's uh, one that was developed up in Canada. It's a late bloomer. But, uh, and it's named after the guy that, that developed it's named after his son that has Down syndrome and it has a very sweet little flower on it. Oh, it is. And that's a special person that it's named after. Very unusual too. And what I love about your plant sale is there's lilacs that you can't get just anywhere. So really that's one of the pulls to come to, to get a lilac that your neighbor isn't going to have. That's right. Uh, we are not, we, we don't worry about national uh, market. And so we have uh, we have what everybody likes around here. And any good tips for us gardeners at home about lilac care? Well, you should uh, uh, plant them so that they're well drained. Okay. And uh, that they you want them so that they get about six hours a day sun. They'll they'll give you leaves no matter where. But uh, if you want flowers, you have to have some sunshine or some light anyway. And what about pruning? Because sometimes they get a little tall. So if we want to prune them, what's that? That's right. To control, uh, if you want them to be a certain height, it's when you prune, not how you prune so much. And uh, you need to prune uh, right after they're all finished blooming. Uh, because if you prune too late after 4th of July, you can prune off all of next year's blooms. So remember, 4th of July is the cutoff for pruning. And I think that's the most important one, yep. <laughs> most important tip. Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, we are just enjoying our day up here at Hulda Klager Gardens. And please go to Gardentime.tv and we'll click over to their website and you get the directions and all the information about coming up here and enjoying the day with your friends and family. Thanks so much, Ruth. It's just gorgeous. Always good to have you here. In the past, we've shown you how to make a raised bed, but now we're going to show you an addition to that. We're going to show you how to put up a really inexpensive and easy hoop house. What this will do is allow you to extend both the spring mm -hmm. and fall gardening seasons, and all you need is a few things to do it. We have to get some rebar. Now this one's about two foot. You can go up to three foot as well. Also, uh, one thing to remember when you're doing this project, mm -hmm. you might want to call 811. That's the call before you dig number, because you never know for sure if there's some kind of utilities or water pipes back here. After that, you get some PVC. How long is this one, Judy? This is about 12 feet, and we found it at a local home improvement store, and sometimes they'll even cut it for you. And then you need some really heavy-duty clamps. So what we're going to do is start by just putting this in the ground. I'm just going to lay this down. Well, it's really easy, easy right now because <laughs> the soil's so wet. So we'll get that in, and it then... It's really good to work with a partner or a friend because this is going to make a really nice hoop to it, but there's a lot of tension, so you want to make sure that it doesn't whip back and possibly hurt you. I'm going to hold this end down until Judy gets her end in. Ah, there we go. And once it's in there, it's pretty good. Now we're going to finish this out, and we'll be right back to show you the finished product. <laughs> Okay. 
We're using clear plastic because it'll let all the light through, but it'll keep the cold weather out. It'll also exclude the rain, so make sure that you're watering. I do love the idea that it's excluding squirrels from digging up my plants and the cats from using it as a litter box. <laughs> you know, we found these great little clamps. They were less than a dollar at a hardware store, and they work really great for just putting right around the edge of the PVC and holding the plastic down tight. You know, this is a simple and easy way to put a little greenhouse right over your raised bed. So try it out for extending your season in the early spring and in the late fall. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. I've been a Capital Subaru customer for 15 years and one of the main reasons is because they treat me well and I want to shop local. The service department is excellent and I always feel like I'm taken care of here. In fact, they call me now even after I've driven off the lot to remind me to come in and get my car washed. That's service. One of the reasons why I like coming to Capital Subaru, actually, they have this, the dog area and I can just walk my dog around the whole area and we can enjoy the outside. I got it my way on the parkway. At French Prairie Perennials, we take pride at being different. From rare, unique, and unusual plant material and handcrafted garden art to our visualscaping program, we can help you create an outdoor living space as unique as you are. Our gift shop has home and garden decor and gifts for all occasions. Visit us at our new location in Aurora, a quick drive from Portland off I-5. French Prairie Perennials, outdoor living elevated. Since 1982, The Wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, The Wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. Locally grown, fresh from the farm, stylish and sustainable, your dream yard starts at Al's Garden Center. Create an inviting gathering place for family and friends with a new patio furniture collection. Our beautiful furniture transforms any outdoor space, large or small. It's like having an extra room outdoors. Then add impact with colorful pottery. Hundreds of unique designs and sizes all on sale now. Al's Garden Centers in Woodburn, Sherwood and Gresham. I'm out with Jan McNeilan and Jan, we love coming out because you always have something interesting. So you have a new tablecloth? Yeah. Or what is this? Well, um, <laughs> this company's no longer in business, but I, th I think it's a good thing to say um, sometimes these cutesy ideas are good mm -hmm. and some are not. And you this is a planting think. kit. <laughs> For someone that's, say, a brand new gardener and they think, well, this is going to make it easy. Help I've me. got the seeds. I've uh -huh. got this to lay out. I know which seeds to put in what hole, except this is ridiculous in, in that there's a cucumber plant here. There's a tomato. There's and another, another tomato. And <clears throat> there's eggplant. And in the other corner, there's a zucchini <laughs> and, and a yellow squash. squash. I mean, if you planted one or a series of zucchini seeds in the center of this, only <laughs> right, would that that would take up the whole space so make sure when you buy something that looks like it's going to be easy that you understand how it works and what the spacing of the plants are going to be um, and talk to some knowledgeable person at a nursery or garden center and, right and make sure that um, your money's well spent it'd be better much better to get a list of, of vegetable plants, how far apart to plant them, buy your seeds, and then go do it rather right. than do all of this. And there is so much information at independent garden centers. I Absolutely. mean, that's why we tell everybody to go there because there's people that are knowledgeable to help veterans and newbies, everybody. Sure. And then also the OSU uh, website oh, for um, for extension communication. So, and then I'm I there's a neighborhood website, and once in a while I see questions about gardening on it, and someone said the other day. If you want to plant potatoes, just go to New Seasons or a natural grocery store and get a, the potato you like and go and cut it into one, in, one or a half inch cubes. Okay. And, and then if you did that though, um, you need, when, 
when you plant a potato, you can plant it just like this. This is a seed potato. It's not out of the grocery store. Okay. This is meant to be, be planted in the garden. Right? You can plant it like this, and your plants are going to come from those eyes we that are there. Eyes, and if those the, little baby if, if it doesn't have an eye, it's not going to grow anything. So there's some more eyes. So I could theoretically plant three different pieces out of that. Mm -hmm. This one is a grocery store out of a bag of potatoes, and they're treated so they don't sprout. Oh, so you And can't. so you don't want right. to do that. Okay. So I, it's just if you're going to, and if you don't have to have a vegetable garden space, you can plant these in containers. Right, right. Makes it fun. easier. Sure. Yeah. No, potatoes are a great time to plant right now, and that is a good tip. So you want to make sure that mm -hmm. you have like those eyes mm -hmm. in all the little, the segments. Right. Some people let these dry and then plant them. Some people plant them right away. I haven't seen that there's a lot of difference. Right. And then what about, you know, you go to the garden center and you see these sales. And so it's kind of buyer beware this time of year well, for some things. Well, it's like anything else. It's seasonal. So right now, a friend told me the other day, I bought tulip bulbs for 50% oh. off. Well, that's because you nor you plant them in the fall. Right. And so it won't hurt those bulbs to stay dry if they're dry and, and healthy. And, and healthy. Mm -hmm. They're already ready to bloom for next year. So frankly, I wouldn't plant them now. Go ahead and say, okay, I bought them, but keep them in a dry spot all summer long mm -hmm. and then plant them in the fall. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's always good tips. And, and there's lots of lots of things that are, sometimes seeds are on sale at during the, the planting season and some germinate better than others. Uh, so really look and, and read all the package because it's right. going to give you all that information right. about that. Exactly. And I see that you have your thermometer, your handy dandy thermometer. So what should we be looking at soil temperature this time of year? Well, right now this is saying about 47 degrees. So um, that's not a warm season crop temperature. That's a cool season like lettuce and potatoes and peas and things like that. So wait until your soil temperature is higher than that, maybe 50 or above to plant your tomatoes and, and warmer Peppers. season. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you put walls of water or some sort of protection on them, I would wait until maybe May something. <laughs> so really watch those temperatures at night because if you do want to go ahead, you really sure. have to kind of protect yeah, them or put to. your walls of water around. Exactly, exactly. And I see you have a gizmo. You always have a gizmo. So what do you have a gizmo for today? This, is, this gizmo is <clears throat> a metal detector and has nothing to do with gardening except I was helping the neighbors prune the other day and I couldn't find these. So I said, I had dropped them, put them down on the ground and then we did a bunch of stuff and there was, it, I knew they were there. So I went and got the metal detector. And you found it. And by golly. <laughs> you know, you always have tips for us. <laughs> there they are. There they are. All and right. I found them right away. There you go. And no stress. Hey, gardening is supposed to be no stress. Yeah. So really, you have all these tips now. You're not, no stress gardening. Take it from Jan and have a great time in your garden this month. Thanks so much, Jan. All right. See you next one. So I have to tell you, I'm very excited to be here. I am at uh, OSU, and I'm with a professor who his name is Bob. That's all you'll give me is Bob. Now, <laughs> Bob, what are you a professor of here? So I'm a professor of integrative biology uh, here at Oregon State University. And the reason that we're talking to you is because there is so much information in movies, in books, on television about snakes. And in the Northwest, I don't think that we seem to have a lot of them, but we actually have some that are very helpful for our gardens. What are those snakes? Well, you're right on the money there, William. Yeah, so uh, we actually have a good uh, uh, number of snakes in the Pacific Northwest and in Oregon and Washington specifically. And uh, so the snakes that I think are most commonly encountered by people in their gardens are, are garter snakes which is another good one to get on there. Not yeah. garden snakes, but garter snakes. And they really, they're, they're pretty just gentle creatures to us, aren't they? They really are. And so I know some people have issues with snakes and so forth, but garter snakes really are very gentle. They, uh, they, they just, uh, they, they don't bite. Uh, they, uh, they'll run from you if you give them a chance. Uh -huh. So they, they're really more worried about being stomped on or, or eaten by your cats and your dogs. And so as like a that. gardener, why would I care if I have them? And why would I want them to actually be in my garden? 
Well, this was I was excited to get a chance to talk to you too, William, <laughs> because uh, I, I, it's a, it's a little. Uh, it's a it's a not a well kept secret that garter snakes just love to eat what I think is most gardeners' worst enemy, and that would be slugs. Really? So slugs are a garter snake's just chocolate candy. And they, see, I like to think that I know stuff I did not know. In my mind, I never knew that slugs would uh, be eaten by snakes at all. Absolutely, yeah. So the garter snakes and actually some of the other species as well. They love to eat uh, slugs. I've had reports from lots of gardeners who screwed up their courage and, got, and <laughs> threw the snakes into the garden, and sure enough, they will take care of them. But also things like beetle grubs and, uh, and other associated, uh, you know, uh, even fly maggots, things like really? that. They, yeah, they will, they will really take them take So them to you town. said that, that they screwed up their courage and they threw them in. You're suggesting if you don't see snakes in your yard, you could actually find some and add them to your garden then. You sure could. We were joking just the other day and talking about, you know, get some Boy Scouts or some <laughs> young boys, young girls, get them out in the field. They love to catch those and they really are ubiquitous around the Northwest. Yeah. So anywhere in parks and around water especially you can find them, especially this time of the year when the, when the temperature's warming up, the sun's coming out. You can get those, you can just translocate them to your garden. As long as you have a place for them to, to spend the night, then you're all set. You will actually make it uh, make it snake friendly. And in uh, in your mind, you seem to think that a a really balanced place has some snakes. You shouldn't want to be snake free necessarily. I think that's the case. Yeah, unless you live right in the middle of a city or something, that's really a sign. By having snakes, snakes are uh, eating things. Things eat them. That's really a sign that nature's in balance. And and especially for those of us that live here in the Northwest, we're very in tune to that. Uh, to our environment and to, to living a good, healthy life. And so the snakes are a good indicator that, that things are in good shape in that regard. So what would I need to do in my garden to get me some snakes? If I saw one, but I want more, what can I do? Well, good question. So I always say most gardeners, uh, no matter what kind of parcel of land you're on, have some area off in the corner yeah. that's just got last year's pots and pans, and sometimes they've got uh, the boards or old tins yeah. or things like that. And if you just kind of spread those out or even some of the black plastic people like to put down to keep uh, weeds uh, weeds at bay. Uh, that's anything that the snake can get under is something where they can feel safe and that's where yeah. they can spend the night. That's where they're safe from dropping temperatures and so forth. So if it's off in the corner there, that'll be a nice little refuge for them. It's not something that's right up next to your house and so you'll be all, you'll be all set. Well, listen, I, I know that there's many different thoughts on snakes. All we want to do is tell you that they really do help a garden quite often. So for more information, you can go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to OSU, and you can get a whole list of great information on how you can add them and create balance in your own garden. Thank you so much, Professor Bob. I really have appreciated it. All right, this. William. It was my pleasure. Welcome to Drake's, not your ordinary garden center. Grab a cup of coffee at Antonio's and wander the nursery for the perfect plant. Check out the landscape design showrooms for ideas, then meet with a designer. Come pick out a bouquet of flowers for dinner or for that someone special. Find something distinctive for your home or your garden. Imagine the possibilities and let Drake's turn them into realities. Drake's 70s on Southwest Shoals Ferry Road in Portland. Standard TV and Appliance is the place to buy luxury appliances and more. I agree. At Standard, I got the best selection, best price, and the best service. Standard carries top brands like Wolf, Sub-Zero, Decor, Gen Air, GE, and KitchenAid with great deals on washers, dryers, ranges, and more. Shopping at Standard is a slam dunk. Setting the standard since 1947. Standard TV and Appliance. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Celebrate a spring tradition, visit the Holda Klager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. 
Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs, tour Holder's Victorian home and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. Your garden is only as good as the ingredients you use. That's where Black Gold can help. Black Gold Seedling Mix is formulated for successful seed germination and strong seedling growth. Black Gold Seedling Mix is organic and OMRI listed, so you can start this year's organic garden outright. Look for Black Gold at your local garden center or go online to blackgold.bz. Black Gold, all the riches of the earth. So I'm standing in a beautiful garden. I'm here with Kevin Vaughn, who, Kevin, you are a plant breeder extraordinaire, at least to me you are. <laughs> and we are going to be talking about one specific plant today. Tell me what that is. These are Semper Vivum. Semper Vivum. Most Vivum. people know them as hens and chickens or house leeks. And so before we jump into this, because it's an amazing right. thing you've got going on here, tell me Semper Vivum, Semper Vivum, right. uh, hens and chicks. The other names are like uh, Echeverias. We get all those confused. Right. Define them for me a little. Okay, they're all succulents. They all belong to the big group Crassulaceae. But the, the Semper Vivum all originated in the Alps of Europe. They're, they form a rosette type of plant and they stay low to the ground and they produce offsets and they live forever. Okay. They're very easy, very easy plants. And so then how Very are, hardy too. Yeah, because if, if they're in the Alps, that's, that's right. gotta be up there high and at least cold. <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah, they'll survive zone two even, yes. So what is it that, why, why your passion with these? What is it that you do to, to get the seedlings started? Well, of course I make a crosses between varieties and I have in my head some idea of something I wanna create. Let's say something that's a red that's the size of a football. So I might cross a very large green one and a, and a large red one and hope to get what I want. And so Kevin, you're not just randomly pulling, you actually understand the science of this though, right? <laughs> Most of it. <laughs> so you're looking for like traits from two different plants that you think would be cool if they somehow merge. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. And then how do you go from there when you find those? So after you make the cross, the, the seed head dries and you collect the seed and then you just plant the seed in the pot like this here. Oh my God. That looks like almost like I would I would probably weed that out. It most people like do, yeah. They, they're, not very, they're not very exciting. They're just little green, little bumps. And how long did it take the seeds to do this? They germinate in about two, two weeks, and these are about probably another two weeks old. Really? So, and, but the amazing thing is that in one year's time, after this? you row them out, this is one year's this time. This is just one year's growth exactly. of those. Exactly, it's hard wow. to believe. It is hard to believe. Yeah. And then once they get here, this, these are a year old, right. what is your process from there then? Okay, then we look over the entire bed and we decide which of the ones are the most special and I give them numbers at that point. Uh -huh. And then they're evaluated further and if they pan out for several seasons, they get a name. And what, when, when, what do you mean special? What is special to you? What you look Something for? Something that's unique. I, you know, I like to have a person go into the garden and say, oh, yeah. I know that plant because it's blank. And I've done that today as we walk right. around here. <laughs> right, yeah, so th something that's really unique and, uh, and so something that's incredibly special, something, some people that, something that people really want to buy. Yeah. So. And then after, uh, defined a few seasons, three, four, six, what it is It depends, your... usually it's just two or three for semps. Uh, they're fairly quick, they make a nice clump, and you can tell pretty quickly whether it's gonna be a, a nice plant or not. And then that's not the finish, you take them out and put them somewhere else once you choose them, right? Correct, then a nursery will take over the whole process and they'll, uh, propagate and I get a royalty check at the end nice, of the year. Nice, nice. Now, so, but you do have some that we're gonna to go to a different place that are actually named varieties. Correct. So let's walk over okay. there now. Okay, Kevin, this is what you call your selection bed. Correct. So tell me about these plants and, and how did they make it here for you? Okay, these are ones that I selected initially as a one-year ceiling as being something interesting. And then after it grew into a clump, it's continued to look good and it has good health. I don't want a plant on the market that's a poor grower. Sure, sure. And, and so, and also has to be incredibly distinctive. So like this one right here is patent leather shoes. I've been trying to get something near black and here it is. And you're so close. And then the, yeah. the added bonus for me as, as just a regular consumer would be that dark color edged in that light right. green. It's stunning. I can see why you picked that. Show me another one that you really like. Well, this is, um, 
the big 6-0. When I hit the big 6-0 two years ago, I decided we needed a SEMP to celebrate that, and, <laughs> and here it is. And it does get quite big. It, it, it'll get to about eight or nine inches across. Uh, these are smaller offsets here, but uh, it's a brilliant red color. It is. It's not, it's not that kind of dark, purpley, dusky red that you right. see in the darker ones. That is a very rich right. color. And here's one I'm having fun with. This is, <laughs> this is, this is a, a very unusual form of a semper. It's called a fasciate form. And, and that I, can happen in all kinds of nature, can't it? That's right. That's Fascinating. right. Fascinating. Yes. And here the, the meristem actually is, is a line rather than a, than a point or a That's dome. So cool. And uh, I made one as a child that was called Fuzzy Wuzzy, but it's very, very small. And this is like a giant version of Fuzzy Wuzzy. So, and so can you then, this will be what continues to grow if you're lucky? Yes, and so th this is one I'll, that will probably go on the market in the next several years. So. And when you say go on the market, it's not like I can run to Fred Meyer or someplace and get one of these right now. These no. don't take time to get there. No, these are mostly sold through specialty nurseries. Because you don't, you don't, you're not a wholesaler or oh, a grower no. or any of that. No, this is a one-man operation. Uh, just a one-man <laughs> operation. Right. And so, um, so Kevin, how long have you been doing this? Well, I started when I was nine. Oh my, yeah. my. My neighbor was a plant breeder and she was out crossing these. And I rode my bike by and, and, uh, she's, and I pulled my bike in the driveway and watched what she was doing. And she says, come back tomorrow, you can do your own crosses. <laughs> and I did. And, and two of those plants from those first day of crossing came on the market. Wow. And so it's been a lifetime of fun ever since. Well, and you know, one of the things that I love about these is at a glance from a distance, they might look very similar. They're not. There's so many intricate differences in so many of these plants. So the next time you're out in a garden center and you're looking at these plants, think in the future, that might be one that came right out of his backyard. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. At Garland Nursery, you'll find top quality plants, four generations of garden know-how, fun and fantastic garden decor, and the best in garden supplies. Come visit us at Garland Nursery. Since 1937, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up, and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils, and bark dust, choose Grimm's. U-Haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. Since 1926, Bonide has worked with homeowners to make their homes and gardens beautiful. If you have a garden problem, Bonide has the answer. Tired of slugs eating your flowers and vegetables? Use Bonide's fast-acting slug and snail bait. One application will last up to four weeks. Use Bonide slug and snail bait and get your garden back. Visit Bonide.com to find a local retailer and to download your free Bonide Problem Solver app for your iPhone or Droid. Over the 30 years that our family has been in the nursery industry, we've learned that anyone can supply a customer with plants and garden supplies. But it's supplying those plants and supplies backed by a knowledgeable staff that can transform a garden and take it from ordinary to extraordinary. That's what we do at Sagawa Nursery. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. I'm here with Lori Reinberger, and we are talking about orchids, and you're a part of the Oregon uh, Orchid Society, right? That is correct. So now, I think that, first of all, I think a lot of people get intimidated by them, but we're going to try to make it a little easier and less intimidating to be growing orchids as houseplants. So give me some hints about this. Well, there are really five main things that you really need to think about when you're purchasing a plant and you're putting it in your home. Okay. They like what we like. They like to grow in our climate. So the good news is, is that we can actually try to put them next to regular house plants. Oh. So when you're looking at the five main things, you want to look at light, you want to look at temperature, you want to look at humidity, and you want to look at watering, and you want to work at your fertilizer. And so as long as you're paying attention to those five pretty simple things, 
it, it should work out for you, unless you're one of those people that like your house, you know, like ice cold or <laughs> sweltering hot. But exactly. So if, if you're comfortable, they're probably going to be comfortable. That's exactly right. And if, if you had to like tell people these are the things that the, the, the most common problems, okay, give me some of those. Well, overwatering is a problem, so you got to watch that. Now, would that also be a problem with, like, sometimes, we, a lot of us know that there, there's not a lot of soil in orchids in nature, generally. Correct. So, should we look for plants that are in bark and stuff, rather than soil? Yes, absolutely. Orchids grow best in bark. Okay. You don't really grow orchids in soil, so you actually need an orchid bark. Okay. And it's also good to get all of your orchids growing in the same medium. Really? That way then, when they dry out, they'll dry out all together. Makes Or when you sense. water them, that they'll stay the, the, stay the same. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we, if, if, how do you overwater then something in bark? Well, basically, take them over to your sink water them and I usually do one, two, three, four, five, uh -huh. let the water drain out and then put them back on my shelf. Okay. And then I like to kind of keep an eye on them in about once a week, particularly in the winter time. In the summertime when it gets a little bit warmer, then I water a little bit more often. So what are a couple more of the problems? Well, that we generally of course, underwatering. You yeah. don't want to underwater. So you want to kind of keep an eye on that and look at the plants and things like that. The wrong environment is really a, really a big one because you've got to have the right amount of light. So if you don't have like like southern exposure is a really a tough one. Orchids do not like direct sunlight. So usually an east or a morning sun is a good, good, good lighting um, environment okay. for them. So also poor circulation. So you want to kind of keep a fan around them or air movement going along there. So if you have poor circulation, pests, keep an eye on pests and, and diseases, uh, scale, uh, mealybug. Got to keep an and eye there, on that. And I've, we, you know, we've talked to you before, and it, it's pretty easy to uh, really transplant an orchid. I mean, because we've seen you do it, and you just, you are not gentle. You nope. just tore that thing nope. apart. <laughs> they are easy. They're not, they're in, it's, an, it's a little intimidating yeah. to buy an orchid. You think that they're kind of scary, but they really, really do benefit from being repotted, especially if you buy a plant and it starts to go at start at a bloom, they love to be repotted right after that. So then it might be smart that when you buy an orchid, ask them, how long has this been in bloom? Exactly. So Lori, what should you be asking about or looking for? I think it's important to look at a plant that's in bud, oh. that actually has some potential and some more blooms that are gonna be coming, and that'll stay in bloom for a month or a month and a half after that. And, and that can makes absolutely that. perfect sense. So you know, if you've been thinking about trying some orchids out, you're a little intimidated still, you can go to gardentime.tv, we'll kick you over to their website. You can find out great information, uh, events that are going on, classes you can take, and then you can bring beautiful orchids into your own house. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. The plant pick this week finds us at Shorty's in Vancouver, Washington. I'm with Lisa. Lisa, everything looks so wonderful, but it, it is the time of the year for epimediums. It absolutely is. You know, we get a lot of people coming into the nursery that want to fill a very difficult niche to fill, which is dry shade, and epimedium are perfect for that. There's a wide assortment of varieties with different bloom colors. They are either herbaceous, semi-evergreen, or evergreen. Like I said, they do well in dry shade, so you want to make sure you amend the soil well mm, sure. with some good compost, mound them up, hill them up a little bit when planting them, and water them in their first season while they're getting established. Um, the best way to keep them looking their best is to cut back the previous year's foliage in late winter. That's going to let the blooms really shine when they start popping up. They bloom in late winter through spring, so you get a nice bright pop of color at a great time of year. It is, and they're so cool. They look like little helicopters or little butterflies They or so. really do. I've got a mature sulfurium in my yard, and it's just beautiful. Ah. Well, I'm also going to talk to Mark from Little hey. Prince, Hi. who is a sponsor of our plant pick every week. <laughs> week and so every month and so so tell us more about the ones that you're offering. So we have about a dozen varieties at Little Prince and uh, the, the one I'm holding here is the Sulfurium. Um, I love Cute. its little yellow and white flowers and it's got really cool variegation on the leaves the with little leaves. green and red. Yeah, mm -hmm, Beautiful. So we, we also have Lilithi which is here. Uh, it's a very nice purple and white. Almost and blooming there. And Rubrum over here which is kind of a uh, mauve red color yeah they yeah. are such great because they are really a ground cover too yeah, yeah. in those difficult spots 
Yeah, it's it's a great shade plant. Um, you know, it can go with hosta or aspidistra, you know, in the bleeding hearts. Bleeding hearts. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. so perfect for shade. And so where can we find out where we can get them? Because they're here at Shorty's okay. at their two locations, but where else can we find them? Um, they're at, probably at any garden center in the Portland area. Um, also check out uh, Little Prince's and Shorty's Facebook pages. Okay. Um, we post pictures all the time of our current crops and if you like us on Facebook you'll see a constant stream of what's cool and new <laughs> coming up for the next week. Ah, well you've heard it here, that's our plant pick of the week. It's Epimediums. It's a great plant to have in your garden for spring bloom. Thanks so much you guys. This week's plant pick is brought to you by Little Prince. Our plants won't croak. Look at your home. Winter left behind grungy stained decks, walks, siding and lawn furniture. You know they look awful. Clean them all today with the original and still the best 30 Seconds Outdoor Cleaner. Since 1977, 30 Seconds has delivered clean when you want it clean. Easy to use, spray it on, wait, then hose away winter dirt, grime and stains from algae and mold. From our family to yours, thank you for buying 30 Seconds Outdoor Cleaner. Find it at leading home stores and garden centers. Little Baja is your source for a whole lot of terracotta and concrete too. From bird baths and benches to Buddhas, bears and fountains, plus the exclusive Baja chimney, we have an amazing variety of the finest in terracotta and concrete containers. Come check out our selection of statuary for any garden theme or setting. So for something for the garden, deck, or patio, come see us at Little Baja on East Burnside in Portland. Find us on Facebook, too. <laughs> what are you looking for? Judy, I'm looking for the Garden Time Subaru. William, it's right behind us. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find it, too. It's as easy as going to Gardentime.tv. So click on Gardentime.tv and click on the Subaru. Each month, the Subaru will be in a different location. Give us your best guess, and you could possibly win. Each month, one lucky person will be chosen from all the correct answers. Prizes can include a gift card to a great nursery, some wonderful tools, or other sweet prizes. So go to Gardentime.tv and help us find the Subaru. Millions of tulip bulbs transform this farm into one of Oregon's most beautiful events. The Iversons invite you to the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival presented by Silverton Health. Enjoy a tulip market, food and wine, and fun for the kids. The Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival, open daily 9 to 6, now through May 1st. When we're in our gardens in the spring, it seems we see a lot of slugs and even snails. You know, the snails, it seems that uh, we're seeing them more and more. They may look pretty, but they're doing the same damage that slugs do. And if you have a, you know, trouble identifying what that damage is, we have a couple examples. This is a hosta leaf, and it's that space right there in the middle that has clearly been chewed on by something. And even iris leaves can be uh, attacked by them, uh, either on the side or in the middle. Now the reason they have holes in the middle is because unlike humans and a lot of animals, uh, we have a mandible jaw, which just simply means we can open and shut it, thus giving us the ability to talk. Slugs don't have that. They set on a leaf and they have a rasping jaw. So they do this and eventually, just as you can see that damaging happening there, that's what happens and they put a hole in it. Now we're showing you this damage on hosta and iris leaves, but if you see it on other plants, it's probably slugs and snails as well. We are going to tell you about a wide range of products that will help you in your garden to get rid of these pests. The first one is by Bonide, and this is a product that contains metaldehyde or meta. So when you use this, you do have to be careful around pets and children. The way you apply this is just like you're using a, a shaker of salt around your garden. It's just a light sprinkling in and around the plants. Another product that we have is by Deadline, and there's a liquid and a granular. And so when you do use the liquid, you want to apply it by little drops. You don't want to over apply it because it will not let it be as effective. Also, when you're using the granular, again, you want to scatter it around the garden. Now, if you're looking for something that's organic and more safe around pets and children, you might remember the name Sluggo. It's been around for several years now, and it is basically just iron phosphate. A lot of different names now have iron phosphate only, like Cory's, that's all iron phosphate. Espoma, it's a great product, but it's also iron phosphate. Uh, Bonite also has that kind of natural process as well, but they have done the job of adding spinosad, which will take care of like cinch bugs and cutworms and those pesky earwigs. 
Well, I have a real organic method to use, which is using beer in a little container and put that just a little bit away from the plants. The slugs and snails will be drawn to it. They'll fall into the container, but they'll die happy. <laughs> yeah, for a lot of us Pacific Northwesterners, <laughs> that's just not an option. Ah. Well, I have another method. You can use this copper tape. Now, this is just a little bit more expensive, but this is actually a barrier that you could put around a prize plant or a container. And the slugs and snails cannot go over it because they get an electrical shock and are shocked by it, and they'll drop off. And then the last and final method that we have today is using a piece of wood in the garden. And so check it the next day, the next morning, and if you flip it over, you'll find lots of slugs and snails kind of hanging out underneath it. You can use your pruners to either cut them in half or drop them into a soapy bucket of water, and that'll take care of them. So for just a little bit of time and effort spent in your garden, you can take care of slugs and snails and keep your garden looking lovely all season long. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery. Gardening makes for wonderful family time. Whether it's updating your landscape or planting a veggie garden, at Portland Nursery, our great selection and staff of professionals can help ensure your family's success. Visit PortlandNursery.com for a list of our classes, events, or sign up for our newsletter. Portland Nursery, let our family help your family grow at 50th and Stark or 90th and Division. Do you want to garden more of the year? Then look no further than the Greenhouse Catalog. Our spacious Solex greenhouses provide plenty of room to start hundreds of plants. Get a jump on your spring garden and continue harvesting long after the first frost. Extend your growing season and enjoy mouth-watering tomatoes and fresh vegetables with Solex. Come see us in Salem for factory direct discounts. Find out more at GreenhouseCatalog.com. Color, color, color. When you think of your garden, think of color. Then think of Margie's Farm and Garden. High quality plants and great customer service are our trademark. This week, buy one six gallon berry plant and get one free. You can also stop by for a free hot dog while you shop. Vegetables or herbs, hanging baskets or perennials, trust Margie's Farm and Garden, just off I-5 near Aurora. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Since 1987, French Prairie Gardens has brought you the best in farm fresh produce, beautiful plants, and memorable family events. Spring is here, and now is the time to get your garden ready with our wide selection of bedding plants and hanging baskets. Check out our website for our upcoming events, a schedule of our garden dinners, and information about our CSA program. Experience the best the country has to offer at French Prairie Gardens. Celebrate a spring tradition, visit the Holda Klager Lilac Gardens during the annual Lilac Days. Open daily from 10 to 4. See hundreds of blooming lilacs, tour Holda's Victorian home and gift shop. Take exit 21 off I-5 in Woodland, Washington. In the wintertime, we all want to be out in our gardens, and there is a couple of ideas we're going to share with you today about putting in new fence posts, and this is the perfect time of year to do it. And Judy, I see you're, you, you're digging the hole. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got the short end of the straw here. <laughs> but you know, this is the cornerstone for whenever you want to put up some kind of structure in your garden. When you put a, a fence post in, you really want to dig down about 12 to 18 inches because you want to fill that with cement so that you have a strong support for any of your projects. Yeah, because in the future, you might want to be adding a trellis or some kind of, of gate or something on it. So you want to make sure that's really sturdy. Now, we suggest putting in just a couple of inches of pea gravel into the bottom of the hole. And we do that, Judy, because look at this 
This is the one that we took out of and, the ground. Right, and you know, and if this would have had pea gravel at the bottom, this post wouldn't have been resting right on the mud and starting to rot here. Plus, they didn't use enough cement. This is really just a small portion of the cement you could have used. Then the soil went above it and it started to rot the fence post. So really, it was causing a lot of trouble because it wasn't installed properly. Yeah, and we suggest about one 60-pound bag or just a regular bag that you buy at like a, a hardware store of concrete per post. Now, remember, if you're putting in something that might have a gate on it or if you are going to add trellises, you might even want to put a little bit more because the posts themselves are pretty strong and pretty heavy. One of the first things that you should do when you are setting up a line of fence posts is to make sure that you're on your side of the property and they're all straight in a line. You also want to make sure you're not digging into any gas lines or power lines, so don't forget to call before you dig. Now, before you pour the concrete, make sure that you set your post and brace them so that they're level. Then be sure to double check them and check them one more time. We're using a wheelbarrow to mix the concrete. Now this method of, of mixing concrete is called a wet mix. There are some people that just pour the dry concrete directly into the hole and then let the moisture from the earth, you know, solidify it. However, to us, we think that that probably isn't the best idea because you might get some dry spots and if you wet mix the concrete, it'll actually form itself around the post from the beginning. So it's been about a week since we've uh, put these posts in and we've waited that long because it is, you know, it's a little chilly outside and we wanted to give the concrete the really the best time of curing. We've removed the braces, made sure everything was still mm -hmm. level and now what are you doing, Judy? Well, I'm adding these metal braces in because they're going to be the cross pieces for the fence. You know, if you are doing a trellis or an arbor, you wouldn't need these. That's true, and th right. but we do since we're doing a fence and you know, they're really simple to, to put in. You just have to make sure they're level and then once they're in there, if you need the hammer, Jude, well, there you, you can go. use it, all right, thanks. Then you just slide them in. You might have to tap them down a bit. That was easy. And once that's done, you make sure that you take a screw or a nail and tighten them into the place so it makes them stable. And then really, we can start putting the fence post or the, uh, the fence itself on. Yeah, we'll just be continuing this line here. You know, in future shows, we'll be showing you how to do an arbor, so stay tuned. This is just to go and show you that there's always something to do in the garden, even in the winter time. Thank you so much for watching Garden Time today. If you make it up here to the Lilac Gardens, be sure and take a respite on this wonderful bench, which was put in for all of the volunteers, which not only started by saving this garden, but keep it beautiful every single year. After you stroll through the garden, take a walk to the plant sale area. Pick up a lilac to take home as a souvenir for your garden. So if you have uh, more information you need to gather up on the show today, feel free to always go to gardentime.tv. William and I thank you for watching and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. Judy, yep. do you remember when I asked you if you liked me? I mean, if you really liked me? Yeah, I liked you on Facebook. Yeah, well, I need you to do that again. Well, we really need everyone to like the new Facebook page for Garden Time. So you just go to gardentime.tv and click on the Facebook icon and like us again for our brand new page. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.